Well, in the works, uh, we can tell um, uh, he's Professor Emeritus of uh, Educational Leadership at Temple University, USA. He was a distinguished professor at uh, Educational Studies at uh, Hangzhou Normal University from uh, um, 2018 and 2021. 20, uh, uh, works at the University of Wisconsin and taught philosophy at uh, Kuju University and Stanford University. He taught educational studies at Temple University and uh, earned uh, an uh, ADD in, uh, in uh, organizational psychology from Temple and a professional psychotherapy certificate from the Albert Ellis Institute in 1984. Uh, Leonard Walks is uh, also the author of uh, Education uh, to Mark Zero, The Learning Web Revolution and the Transformation of School. Uh, published in 2013, and the evolution and evaluation of a massive open online course. So, um, MAO System in Motion, uh, published by Palgrave in 2016, as well as numerous scholarly articles and book chapters. Is a, a past president of the John Dewey Society and has been awarded uh, the Dewey Society's Lifetime Achievement Award. Is founding a uh, door of the journal The Wild Science. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, well, the word is uh, yours. Great. In case uh, people didn't catch that, that's Huey and John, you and John. Oh, very, very good. Uh, so the, uh, the conference is gathered to address the boundaries, clusters, and deadlocks in uh, the philosophy of the way of life. And I'm going to discuss both boundaries and crossroads, and there are many. Uh, there's the boundary between uh, philosophy and religion, the boundary between uh, popular philosophy, professional philosophy, et cetera. And uh, philosophy has met many crossroads. I mean, start with the crossroad at the axial age when civilization, according to Jaspers, became self-conscious, uh, the uh, crossroads of modernity and the crossroads that we're now facing that electric uh, referred to at the very end of the talk, where uh, our institutions and our even our planet and our universities are imploding. And so we are looking for some new way forward. The uh, first uh, boundary I noticed between the university and everyday life, and I offer distinction between philosophers as academic professionals, that is, university based scholars, and philosophers as sages offering wise guidance and living. Uh, to themselves and other people. Uh, academic philosophers typically address fellow scholars and university graduate students. By contrast, philosophical sages, in, in addition to their, them own, their own self, have audiences composed of non-philosophy professionals, well, non-philosophy and not professionals even, but interested in often spiritually or psychologically ill people from all walks of life. So the first question is, does academia, as it's currently constituted, set a boundary, a PWL, a boundary that excludes philosophers as sages? And that's really the big part of my talk, that question. Uh, academic professionals have, I think you can go to the next slide. So this is the first part of the talk. Academic professionals have specialized academic training leading to a doctorate and a license to teach at a university. These professionals do original philosophical research published in peer-reviewed professional journals. And they deliver a philosophy curriculum encompassing a body of literature, including at times the wisdom literature generated by philosophical sages. Plato and Aristotle were the academic professionals of their time, although as John pointed out this morning, they were also sages. Uh, the contemporary counterparts, in, uh, contemporary counterparts include many Anglo-American and continental philosophers populating our university departments, including uh, some who have even turned their attention to philosophy as a way of life. By contrast, Confucius, Socrates, and Jesus, the author Gautama, the Buddha, Epictetus, and others were sages, the authors of the Upanishads, the Dhammapada, of Genesis and Exodus, were philosophical sages. For me, the question of philosophy as a way of life is the first instance about whether philosophy is a way of life, practitioners are to be primarily academic professionals or philosophical sages, or both. Uh, philosophy is a way of life philosophers to offer scholarship of concern primarily to other academic philosophers 
or are they to offer sage life guidance and programs of personal growth and transcendence drawn from their life experiences, philosophical reflections, and grasp of their philosophical and wisdom traditions? Put another way, is the goal of philosophy as a way of life to, combine, to convey a refined scholarly understanding of the reflections of historical figures like Confucius, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and the Stoics, but to engender life changing patterns of conduct along lines akin to those proposed by these actual age figures. This leads us to ask just what is the relationship between philosophical understanding and personal change? Something that Eli addressed in his talk this morning. Uh, I'm going to have a less sanguine view of that, but uh, I, I grant Eli's point that, that it's possible. Uh, it, um, this leads us to ask what the relation between philosophical understanding and personal change is. Is a new understanding, even one based on close study and intellectual reflection and discussion, sufficient for transformative behavioral change? Or even an important factor, or even a minor factor. Does transformative change require something more? Next slide. Oh, so there's the question. Next slide. So this leads us to part two of my talk, Reason and Habit in the Conduct of Life. This brings me to the work of psychologist Chris Arduris and pragmatic philosopher Donald Schoen on the theory of action. Uh, for Arduris and Schoen, people form mental maps for planning, implementing, and evaluating their actions. These are shaped by their social context, these are conventional, and people are aware of the maps that they hold. The maps that acquired the local level of awareness and reflection and function on an unconscious level embodied as habits. But people also form and espouse explicit theories of their actions, theories of what they do and why they do it, which are generally not congruent with the mental maps that actually guide their actions. These espouse theories are shaped by formal education, scholarly reading, discussion, and reasoned reflection. So there's a gap, a gap between what people actually do is guided by their mental map and habits and what they think and say about what they do. They have implicit, unconscious theories of use which are mentioned, which are embodied in habit and can only be teased out by observers from a third person perspective. And they have explicit and valid theories of action which they're not ashamed to tell us well by themselves. An implication of this duality is that while those seeking to change beliefs and rational understandings by providing lectures, written texts, new concepts, and arguments for reflection and discussion, these are unlikely to affect significant and lasting changes in behavior. To affect changes of behavior in ways of living, one has to address the mental map for underlying theories in action or embodied habits. These are impervious to rational discourses, at least taken in isolation. Change requires something else, something more. Mental maps must be addressed on the level upon which they were first formed. Individuals must be placed in new cultural environments with new norms and values, an ashram, a church, a monastery, along with opportunities to test out, try out new behaviors, and in these contexts, people can feel the advantage of the new behaviors, be clear about the disadvantage of their older mental maps, and gradually form new habits, new mental maps that gradually approach their spouse theories. Okay, so here's pictures of Arthurus and Sean. Good, and the idea one thing to think and say what you do, another thing what you actually do. Okay. Um, now this means uh, this means that uh, philosophy is a way of life. Philosophers have to reflect on the methods of transformation employed by previous philosophies as ways of life. Perhaps those especially used during what Yasmus called the Axial Age, the period from roughly 800 to 200 BCE, when humanity faced the crossroads and our enduring philosophical and religious traditions emerged. 
among the axial age singers. I'm, I'm very clear that's a lot of discussion about Jaspers and the axial age and everything like that. I'm using it as a shorthand, and I hope everybody can take it in that, in that uh, vein. Among the axial age thinkers, and here I come to spiritual practices, Pythagoras brought his followers together in a brotherhood where members engaged in various ceremonies and rituals, including communal meals, music, and dance. They abstained from eating meat. Socrates gathered his group of friends together in the Agora. Aristotle also stressed the importance of a body of group of friends. He said, friends live together, meaning not that they live in a community or brotherhood necessarily, but they get together frequently, not just for amusement and mutual benefit, but primarily to reinforce each other's character developments. While Socrates and the Stoics gathered audiences in public places, and Plato and Aristotle in academies that were open to young men, Epicurus procured a private house with a pleasant garden where only his followers could convene. Like Socrates and Aristotle, he emphasized the importance of a community of friends for mutual support and intellectual exchange. And he, like Pythagoras, prescribed a simple frugal diet and detachment from external goods, like, like wealth. Confucians built Shuyan's academies, not a quick idea, translation, living organisms of scholars and students who, like the Epicureans, gathered in aesthetically pleasing surroundings for discussion and meals and, and booze. Uh, Buddhists established monasteries, communities of men and women, monks and nuns, who would support society to create a separate community for meditation and study with prescribed alternative living practices, including begging for meals to engender humility and detachment from material life. The third century Christian fathers dispersed to the Egyptian desert, taking vows of austerity, prayer and work, work, karma, yoga, work practices. Uh, uh, you find this in, in uh, all monasteries, forming the basis of later Christian monasteries. Now, these additional elements, beyond lectures, reading, and rational discussion, called upon by these traditions, have much in common, although the commonalities can be overemphasized. Community or brotherhood of students, groups of wise friends, alternative, habit-breaking ways of living. To the extent that philosophy is a way of life teaches that changes in ways of living, so to the extent that philosophy uh, as a way of life philosophy function as a philosopher stages. To that extent, PWL has to consider these means employed to affect behavioral change, perhaps with particular attention to the means employed by earlier philosophical and religious schools. Books, lectures, and seminars, the methods of the academic professional will not be sufficient to transform their change. More promising means, however, those involving New sociocultural environment, new opportunities to try out new behaviors may feel alien to academic professionals, even those engaged in philosophy as a way of life. And they're certainly going to be rejected by a university college. I mean, you can imagine sending your kids out to next for food on the quad or something like that. <laughs> Just that's not going to fly. Next slide. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, okay, good. So, Next to section, university and the culture of professionalism. And here I move from psychology to sociology. Why are these uh, uh, additional means likely to be felt as alien? Why are philosopher sages unlikely to get much traction in academia? Why do these added elements run so much against the academic professional grain? The idea of the college teacher as an academic professional is relatively new. You know, back before the research university, you know, like Oxbridge and American Liberal Arts Colleges and like professors or teachers thought of themselves as bringing students along spiritually. I mean, all in a Christian context, but, uh, but we don't do that anymore, right? Uh, it's relatively new. Academics became professionals in a contemporary sense at the same time that other professions, medicine, law, and other professionals in medicine, law, engineering, took their established roles as research-based university-educated specialists, that is, after 18. 
Prior to 1850 or so, college teachers, like other knowledge workers, acquired their trade skills by working under the guidance of a senior practitioner, and they gained credibility, not through specialist credentials beyond bachelor's degree in case of the teachers, but by word of mouth reputation. Kids go to college, this professor think, oh, you're really a good kid. Why don't you come along and work with me and we'll make you a, a lecturer, something like that. They had maybe stayed along and got a master's degree just for hanging out for a year or something like that. While many teachers were specialists in various branches of the arts and science, all had general knowledge in all of them and frequently taught several, as is the practice today at St. John's College in Annapolis. They all do Greek and Latin, they all teach calculus and uh, metaphysics. Philosophers, like other skilled workers, establish their position in the modern university by this, oh, sorry, in the before the modern by displaying academic talents gaining the attention of their teachers and mentors in writing lectures and sermons. The PhD degree in order for original research evolved in its current form as a credential for academic professionals in the late 18th and early 19th century philosophy and Germany. After the establishment of the German university, starting with the University of Berlin in 1810, Scholars from other nations, England and the United States and uh, other places, went to Germany to acquire a PhD degree. American doctorate granting research universities, such as Cornell and Johns Hopkins, were founded on German models at the end of the 19th century. The UK followed by introducing a research doctorate in 1917, largely as a defensive measure to stem the flow of English to go to Germany to study. The professionalization of Academics, but part of the rise of a culture of professionalism. Here, I refer to a book by Burton Bledstein from 1975, but still extremely rewarding reading. After the industrial developments in the 18th and 19th centuries, the scale of industry in Germany, England, Western United States grew exponentially. Firms could no longer rely on skilled workers who had worked under senior craftsmen and gained word of mouth reputations. Firms grew to the point where they needed steady supplies of standard engineers, product designers, finance people, marketing people, transport specialists, agronomists, hydrologists, and the like. The general scarcity of such workers and the high cost of securing them in the labor market, and how are you gonna find out whether somebody can do it? You know, you talk around and it's like there's no standardization. So this necessitated new methods for training and standardized credentials. The new university responded with degree programs in this field. In the United States, the federal government provided funding for the new colleges by granting large expanses of federal lands to be sold off by the states to build universities. These land grant colleges offered occupational careers, primarily in agriculture, engineering, and commerce. Professional education in law and medicine, formerly haphazard in the United States, was also standardized and brought under the control of research universities at the beginning of the century. College and university enrollments now grew rapidly, and as the institutions required reliable new teachers, college teaching was also fully professionalized with a research based doctor's degree forming the prerequisite. In okay, so now. Uh, yeah, already here, good. So now I move from uh, sociology and economics. Uh, it's not difficult to explain this push towards academic standardization, or indeed standardization in manpower and in parts and products, etc. Standardization makes things cheaper. You want to find a part for your clock? It's like it's like a part 142. You buy it on Amazon. <clears throat> You know, if you have to take the part apart and measure it, whatever, it's like it's, it's cost, it's not cost effective. We can explain standardization in the labor markets by turning to the ideas of economist Ronald Coase, a professor of economics at the uh, University of Chicago Law School, who received the Nobel Prize in Economic Science in uh, 1991. A co in the article, uh, The Nature of the Firm, 1937, introduced the concept of transaction costs to explain the limits of markets, the growth of firms, and the internalization by firms of professional labor, how they hired university-educated workers as full-time employees of the firm, rather than as contracted workers 
found in the labor market. Simply put, firms would rather acquire labor in the market and, the only, and only to acquire and, and, and pay for it at such times as specific skills are needed. You know, okay, we need one of these guys, go find them, bring them in. Okay, we need to get rid of that guy, we need another guy, go find them. The problem is full-time employment is efficient, is inefficient. The firm just cannot use full-time workers all the time for their highest value tasks all day long, every day. And as a result, there will always be time when full-time high-value employers will either have to be assigned lower-value tasks, which could just as well be done by much less costly workers, or left idle altogether. But when the costs of finding, recruiting, hiring, training, and bringing on board uh, workers, these transactions costs are considered, the equation changes. If there are sufficient workers with standardized training and a diploma signifying standard knowledge and standard skill, transaction costs are greatly reduced. Go find me an engineer. Firms don't have to recruit, evaluate, contract, and train workers individually. They can depend on universities to produce large numbers of capable graduates with standard training and skill. The firms, industries, or professional bodies can even work with universities to design a curriculum suitable for external needs. Next one. Yes. So let's consider this arithmetically. And there's a gross simplification. Okay. Suppose the inefficiency of a full-time employee is up 10% of revenue, so I know 10% of the time. But suppose the firm has to devote 20% of revenues in transaction costs to hire contract labor in the market as needed. They save 10% of their revenues by internalizing workers. Okay. Once universities grow to supply the economy with these graduates, they also have to expand their faculties rapidly. And as long as philosophy is a university subject, they're going to need philosophers. Using the PhD from a highly reputed graduate program significantly lowers transaction costs. I mean, imagine talking around the money. Does anyone know what smart kid, you know, in undergraduate school? Uh, the degree signifies the university that it's fair can perform the task of the standard metaphysician, logician, epistemologist, or ethicist. Also teaching standard courses and producing standard academic research in standard academic journals. Next, uh, uh, the next uh, slide is the academic professional and the positive knowledge ideal. So this is going to bring us to what the standards are. What is the standard? The new research university of the early 19th century, the late 18th and early 19th century, adopted the standard of positive knowledge. This is where Compton's notion of positivist comes from. Although he had specific, it had nothing to do with logical positivism. Well, not that, had a little. All scholars associated with that ideal, whether in the science, the natural sciences, or humanities, especially you know, um, language studies, uh, they shared three basic attitudes, and this was a kind of compromise between the religious folks, the natural science folks, the philologists, and the like. We're going to all kind of get together on agreeing to some things about all the two. First, an anti speculative outlook. <laughs> two, the use of inductive methods of inquiry employ empirical observations or philological study of texts and artifacts. Three, Conclusions drawn from such methods and procedures. So here's your right. You find some data, you use a method, you know, whatever. These commitments were developed by Austrian and German scholars in the late 18th and early 19th centuries and spread to Europe, North America, and elsewhere. F. L. Gilifer says, quote, in a good study of this in uh, uh, the 19th century, the ability to produce positive knowledge. In this very sense, became the key trait of scholarship and science as they were established as professionalized endeavors. The PhD then became the apprenticeship in positive knowledge. The positive knowledge ethos is still dominant in uh, academia and makes the provision of life transforming new cultural environments and new norms and values and opportunities to try out new ways of uh, living and thinking alien. Professors just do not organize brotherhoods or send students out begging for meals. 
Given the unconscious mental maps and habits formed by academics during their undergraduate and graduate studies, special environments within the university suitable for transformative learning are likely to feel funny, not quite right, strange, embarrassing, and met by their colleagues with hostility. Uh, okay. There are, however, some popular non-academic philosophers who may be worth considering as possible role models or templates for philosophy of the way of life. Now, this section is a shorter part. By the way, I started writing this paper Monday morning, and uh, there, are, there are already sections I've thrown out. But, but so here I'm only going to talk about popular philosophy, not popular psychology, yoga, or new age practitioners. No right to masters here. <laughs> uh, okay, so here are some touch from trying to look from the models of the new what might have looked like. Emerson. At one point, Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, was not included in the university philosophy curriculum. Today he is considered at least a popular philosopher. Doesn't look like uh, it doesn't look like a PhD dissertation or a journal article, but we'll we'll give them a break, right? Emerson began his career as a junior pastor of Boston's second church. But in 1832, he wrote in his journal, I have sometimes thought that in order to be a good minister, it was necessary to lead the ministry. Okay, so he's going to move out of the church thing to the philosophy as a way of life as an independence lecturer. Emerson's 1845 lectures included Plato or the philosopher, Swedenborg or the mystic, and Montaigne or the skeptic. His lectures in the 1850s, the whole period on the conduct of life, shows his interest in practical aspects of human living, including wealth, health, beauty, and culture. Not bound by academic norms or strictures of positive knowledge or religious norms outside the universe, Emerson could work as a philosopher sage addressing the existential problems of human life. Here's a class of Alcott. Emerson's transcendentalist colleagues also offer philosophical books and lectures as well as more direct practical means for personal transcendence. Emerson's friend Bronson Alcott, 1799 to 1880, about the same period, Emerson, a popular philosopher sage with little formal education, founded Fruitlands, a transcendentalist experimental community, a place we could try out new behaviors. Alcott reframed Emerson's transcendentalism as a form of religious anarchism, kind of do your own thing, anarchism. He linked spiritual regeneration to physical health, stating that the outward abstinence is a sign of inward fullness. So back to kind of frugal, modest living practices, the residents at Fruitland subsisted on a modest vegetarian diet, drank only water, took cold baths, and renounced all use of artificial light. No animal labor was permitted, and the use of animal products was forbidden. Animals are impressed. The uh, members of the, of the commune wore only linen clothing. Cotton fabric was forbidden because it exploited slave labor, and a wall was banned because it came to the Okay, my favorite case. Okay, Wallace Waddles. A later Emerson disciple, Wallace Bottles, 1860 to 1911, nice overlap with James, uh, was like Henry James Sr., proponent of the new thought. Bottles wrote What is Truth and the New Christ, kind of the new new man kind of thing, right? uh, as well as books on practical topics, including scientific marriage, the new science of living and healing. The constructive use of foods, the science of getting rich, and the science of being great. Like Emerson, Waddles made a living by publishing popular writings and giving public lectures. And he was very successful, by the way. Um, he was without any question regarded as a philosopher by his popular audiences. He is today known as the mastermind behind the secret, the idea popularized by. Uh, Rhonda Burns that one does not need to take effortful steps to achieve one's aims, but merely concentrate them and they will manifest by themselves. 
another commonplace library. By the time of his greatest success from 1900 to 1910, the conception of the philosopher as an academic professional was just becoming established, and models could be written off as a crackpot by professional philosophers. Despite his continuing influence today, I doubt that anyone would dare consider adding him to the philosophy curriculum of the university. Now, here are two. I uh, actually have pictures of these guys, and so I've got a feeling who they, who they are. The next slide is maybe more interesting. So the next two guys I'm going to talk about are Ken Keyes and Bert Ehrhardt. Okay, so Ken Keyes is a um, rough contemporary, died in 1995, who set about synthesizing the lessons in the global wisdom literature in his book, The Handbook to Higher Consciousness. Keyes attended Duke University for two years, entered military service in naval intelligence. And in 1943, he, he made a documentary film about uh, Alfred Korzybski at the Institute uh, of General Semantics. He later graduated with a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Miami, but never became a psychologist. In 1946, at the age of 25, Keyes contracted polio and remained a quadriplegic for the rest of his life living for most of his life in a reading machine. He set out to overcome this disability in thinking, reading, and undertaking various spiritual practices. He published his first book, How to Develop Your Thinking Ability, a primer on informal logic and semantics in 1950. Meanwhile, he uh, developed a large retail uh, practice and became fabulously wealthy. In 1970, although he spent his whole life in a breathing machine, a wheelchair, and a life, he died. 1970, he spent some time at Esalen Institute in California and was opposed to the teachings of Chokyam Trungpa and Alan Watts. Subsequently, he lived in a commune with disciples of Ram Das and a Trappist monastery, and he also visited Trungpa at his center in Barnat Boynet, Barnet was of Vermont, where they discussed the idea that the minds of the action rather than external circumstances, was what generated personal unhappiness, an idea he's also found in the Stoics and other wisdom literatures. These years of struggle, travel, and encounter led to 1972 to formulate his 12 pathways, explicated in the Handbook to Higher Consciousness, a self-published book that sold more than 1 million copies. Self-published. In fact, the first book he did was published by Knopf, and he went back to rights. They want any, any, any gave away all his money, basically. The Pathways Method is explained in greater detail in uh, the book, How to Enjoy Your Life, 1984, and the specific practices and exercises are presented in the Handbook to Higher Consciousness, the workbook, 1986. So he has a very, very definite explicit set of practices and a workbook where you can kind of make sure you're doing it the right way. The core of this pathways method is the strict memorization and repetition of the 12 pathway statements. It's the three jewels of wisdom, right? Memorize, repeat, inside the come. Practitioners not really read and understand the lesson, which would make a little bit like regular philosophy but they repeat and reflect upon them frequently each day, like some of the people that are drawn mentions, especially when upset, thus installing an abbreviated compilation of the world's wisdom teachings into right into their lives. Practitioners experiencing stress could observe the results empirically. As they review the pathways, they're scanning their emotions. And one of the pathways will illuminate the cause of the distress and notice it diminishing. This practice brings prior unhelpful mental math practitioners to mind and guides them in replacing them with the philosophical wisdom embodied in the pathways. She has established residential centers for his teaching. Uh, he offered week long workshops, including vegetarian meals, obligatory chores and practice in meditation with the pathway method. Uh, I talk about his later work in philosophy, which is moved away from this. Okay, Werner Erhard. Uh, Erhard, a highly controversial example of a popular philosopher, 
did not attend college. Instead, he married high school sweetheart and went off to work as an auto salesman after receiving training from Lee Iacocca. The name will mean something to America, so it doesn't mean to other people. Snake oil salesman personified. Uh, <laughs> later, he worked as a door to door salesman for the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, he absorbed the works of neo Freudian psychologists such as Abraham Maslow and Eric Fromm, befriended Alan Watts, and studied Zen in Japan. Philosopher Michael Simmerman said that Earhart, quote, had no particular <laughs> formal training in anything, but he understood things as well as anyone I've ever seen, and I've been around a lot of smart people in academia. I was fortunate enough to have a couple of conversations with them, totally concur with that judgment. Eric also built around himself a whole bunch of academic world, well, famous one, Varela and a bunch of other people. Uh, his er, Earhart's essay training program included a workshop as well as seminars in health and the body, sex, wealth, and money. For themselves, sex and money. Participants with shared thoughts and hang ups. They were encouraged to try out new behaviors. And in the 10 day S course, they, uh, 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 Earhart set up residential living centers with exercise, obligatory chores, modest vegetarian meals, and spiritual exercises. I hope that's beginning to sound repetition. Okay, can any of these factors serve as philosophy of way of life, role models, templates, or provides any suggestive hints about a way forward? Is there any place with such figures in PWL, either in the current professionalized academy or line behind it? Now I get to uh, lecture's point at the end, a new axial age. Earlier, I mentioned Jasper's contested notion of an axial age marking a new, more reflective beginning for civilization with their consciousness of themselves and not as the coast says, you know, they could begin to think about how to make themselves, have technology to sell. Now, some see our current civilization at a crossroad, just like the crossroad, of, the crossroad at the actual age, the age of Aquarius, or whatever, with a chance to make another new beginning for humanity. We see many of our institutions imploding right in our eyes. We're impacted, perhaps overwhelmed by new digital technologies, the internet, artificial intelligence, we face Daunting challenges from neoliberal hegemony, rising authoritarianism, the death of the liberal state, wars and climate change, and mass migrations, and even the potential for planetary collapse. Many thinkers, both within and beyond academia, have for decades seen these challenges giving rise to a new age, or at least a potential marked by global awareness and spiritual awakening. Next slide. Next slide. There we go. Oh. Spiritual. <laughs> Meanwhile, the university is under, under attack from the authoritarian right, and in some ways collapsing under its own weights. In the United States, enrollment is declining in the face of exorbitant tuition. They're exorbitant because the state no longer supports the university because it has to pay incarceration for so many. Students are now nonetheless urged to go to college, but to gain access to professional employment. And occupational programs at the university are now privileged over those in the arts and sciences. Adjuncts cover an increasing share of the teaching load in the humanities. Tenured professors are not replaced when they retire. Graduate programs turn out unemployable PhDs, while the humanities departments are even closed and tenured faculty are fired. It is reasonable to ask whether the model of the philosopher's academic professional remains sustainable. The internet and the AI play a role in this unfolding drama. I'm coming back to co-ways. In the high-tech era, there's a movement away from mass production as numerical controlled software makes it possible to respond to small markets and even individual desires. In the internet era, anyone can learn essentially anything online with free courses and the, from the best universities and video tutorials available on every subject, every topic. Individuals can demonstrate their capabilities with user-friendly blogging, presentation software, videos, and podcasts. They can make their capabilities known to employers through YouTube and LinkedIn. They can also 
make it clear to individual employers why they fit exactly and can get to those employers. This signals a radical change in transaction costs. Search software and AI make it possible for firms to find precisely the skills they need when they need them. The book of my um, uh, Clay Sturton, here comes everybody, right? That's the idea that everybody can do your job for you. Don't need a PhD, don't need a college degree. Full-time employment is now declining and the gig economy is spreading. Enterprise uh, needing labor can find just what they need uh, at just the right time at a low cost in the network labor market. So now let us return to our Coasian calculation. If the inefficiency of the full time labor is 10%, but the trans transaction costs of the labor company is now only 5%, why hire employees? The same calculation applies to universities. If they can readily find inexpensive adjuncts with doctorates to do the standard undergraduate teaching, why would they burden themselves with tenure track professors? This pattern is not sustainable. It depends on graduate programs training unemployable doctoral grads for low contract, low pay contract work. The adjuncts are striking, and over time, we maybe expect to see the system itself morph into something new. And when it does, at the edge of chaos, a new paradigm for higher learning. Perhaps philosophy as a way of life is a part of this very search for a new paradigm for humanity's scholarship beyond the research university and the college positive knowledge ideal. I mean, like philosophical counseling, philosophical workshops, philosophy courses, workshops, residential centers. Eli is an expert on this. He's written about every one of them. Perhaps new spaces will open for philosophy and workshops, counseling, residential living, but transformative learning is no longer alien at the standard of care. Uh, thank you very, very, very much, uh, Leonard. Uh, so we, yeah, we can open that for the answer. The first one is uh, uh, uh Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, it was very provocative, very stimulant. Um, I uh, I have um, a request for clarification. Uh, so when you talk about philosophical sages, what do you mean by philosophical here? Uh, are there non-philosophical sages? What's the difference between philosophical and non-philosophical sages? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned Socrates as an example. So it would be easier to understand how he is a philosophical that's sage that's in a certain sense. Uh, so but we I'm cheat. Gonna take that first. Just to go. So I, I, all these are just kind of marginal. I don't. I don't mean to you know be grandly precise here. Uh, but you know, philosophy is initially the love of wisdom, and this is exactly what you see in Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, etc. I mean, it's Aristotle's most perfect example. You know, it's the love of wisdom so great that actually transcends the human condition. You know, that kind of contemplation. Uh, Socrates as well. It's a philosophical life. What is it? it's like? Thinking about life, it's like with a bunch of events, ignoring all the opinions out there. It's like transcending the ordinary world and kind of becoming new men, right? So by a stage, I'm just, I just mean like somebody who is sort of in that ballpark. So Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, certainly Epictetus, uh, but also Confucius, uh, Lao Tzu, if he ever existed, uh, Guamsu, et cetera. So I, I mean, to sort of bring together a bunch of people who are dishing out what sounds kind of like philosophy and in a way that's designed not to create understanding, but to aid people in a kind of moving from point A to point A. But were you also thinking about something as a non-philosophical sage or uh, this wouldn't be a... I mean, again, no, non-philosophical... <laughs> no, you're doing great. Probably third.
Very common. Yeah. Uh, so, do you also contemplate the possibility of there being non philosophical sages, or would this be a. Well, I don't, no. I'm, not, I'm not concerned too much with that because, like I say, I'm, this is all painting with a four inch paintbrush. I'm not in the same business that John is in. <laughs> uh, it's not my concern to make very short distance or worry about them. John's not worried about the media, really. At the end, he showed it. He don't care anyone not you, really. But, uh, 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 so think about a sage as a person who seeks wisdom and seeks to impart it. And so I see that sage and the philosophy tradition is very much uh, connected. That's Thank you. Uh, So oh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, my question is: in order to find a new role of philosophy, um, could we include? Uh, could could we still include philosophy in the humanities, uh, in contrast to the professional knowledge? This maybe uh, we have to redefine also. A, a new uh, knowledge in relation to the humanities that is not more uh, so sufficient to uh, face the so the crisis of the humanities and of the philosophy. Maybe what do you know? Yeah. Well, you know, at the end of uh, the morning session, Professor of course, she was talking about. Uh, uh, the need for better philological knowledge. And clearly, that's necessary. And at lunchtime, Pablo was talking about the same thing with uh, Sanskrit. Uh, and you know, the thing is, you could maybe, maybe you got to think that certificates are going to be necessary. I mean, I'm a philosopher, a psychologist, and a social scientist, and a therapist. And so I got a lot of things going. And so this gives me a toolkit. I can't read Chinese. Uh, but I'm all over China. I finally think I was in Kubu and I was asked to give a lecture in Kubu about Confucius, about whom I know absolutely nothing. And who was there? Like the, the whole current generation of the Confucius family. <laughs> it was like, oh, it's so wonderful to know that somebody in the West knows so much about Confucius. I mean, I guess the, the, the point is, get friends with two kids, and we don't know what they are because we're, in, we're at a crossroads. Right, a council is going to have to know something about human relations and how to read the behavior of other people. On a, you know, a uh, you know a workshop leader. I give a lot of workshops in design. I have to know how to do that. And the markets are actually now developing conferences. Well, you know, there's going to be conferences like the uh, Stoicon. Yeah. Right. So the Stoicon might be like a kind of example of, but somebody has to know how to make a Stoicon. So, so I guess my, my answer is, let's not get the prescriptive to ask. It's going to take a lot of different skills. Uh, it's, a very, it's, it's a silly question, just coming out. But uh, John, you'll probably um, criticize me for it, because it, you're probably right that it's maybe just a point of view. But I'm uh, just listening to you. Um, and I agree with what, a lot of what you were saying. Do we need to go back, or if there was ever a back, the idea of philosophy is just utterly subversive. And and I mean, when you're talking about it, kind of we live in a we we, we live in a right wing culture now. That's just the reality. Um, and that means the neoliberal he hegemon is our philosophers. Philosophers just don't have courage anymore. And um, that's my question. Um, and that's what it comes down to. You say the edge of edge of reason and the crisis. It's happening. We know it's happening. We're moving towards that destruction. But I see very little courage um, amongst philosophers, and there's a lot of complaints. You know, this is a, I hear it every day. People about the publishing industry, bureaucracy, and do something about it. Show courage. You spend your life writing about Walter Benjamin or Nietzsche or Kierkegaard or whoever. You know, most of these people live lots of subversive lives as philosophers and. I've met very few courageous philosophers. It's my provocative question. Well, you know, there's a wonderful book by Russell Jacoby called The Last Intellectuals. I don't know if you know this wonderful book, but uh, Russell Jacoby's uh, Academic Freedom 
has become the freedom to be an academic. And the uh, courage is, yeah, we've heard about tenured radicals, right? They have a lot of courage because they think you can't get fired. Uh, so I'm kind of with Confucius here. I'm, you know, I see people like Henry Thoreau and uh, other intellectuals, but they're out there being courageous and speaking truth to power. I think it's kind of arrogant. I mean, who the hell is that guy that thinks anybody's going to listen to him? Uh, I'm kind of with Confucius. You know, you find the people who might, and Aristotle, you know, Aristotle goes and works with the Macedonians, thinks maybe they've got an ear for this kind of stuff. Confucius thinks the same. You, know, you, you can find some leaders and rulers who are really interested in thinking about what they're doing. You can help them. When they go here, you back off. You know what? You back when, they, when the ruler becomes kind of evil and dangerous, you don't stick around with courage and tell them to. There's a wonderful story in uh, Johnson, the inner books of Johnson, where a character named Confucius was confronted by a young river snappers. He's going to go up and he's going to show that king over there what's what. <laughs> you can get yourself killed, you know. And he says, "Well, what do I need?" He says, "He says the men of old knew that you had to have an interview before you could give it to somebody." And uh, the uh, the therapist said, "Well, what do you mean have it in?" And she says, "I, I eat a vegetarian diet. I, I, I exercise. You know, I think every day." And you know, the Confucius character is actually. Lanza says, no, no, no. It's like when you know it, you're just gonna go there and handle it. So so I'm kind I'm kind of with that. I'm not too big on courageous philosophers. This is not to say I'm a cowardly philosopher. I'm kind of more than Aristotle, you know, don't be rash. Well, but anyway, I say Craig, let's say it's more of the bar to be other fair not to in within the academy, you know, and it's not, and I agree with you, there's an arrogance in courage, but I'm talking about the courage of of saying no, and that's where I believe that that that, 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 that affirmative no, and the Camus sense or in the in the Bartleby sense. Look, there are times when we have to stand up. Clearly, we'll know. Uh, uh, thank, thank you so much for that. That was very uh, provocative and entertaining. As you mentioned, Stoicon, I just wanted to. <laughs> make a couple of observations about the current modern Stoic movement. Yes, yeah. um, um, quick um, sort of declaration at the beginning, modern Stoicism is completely non-profit and we run courses that are free for everyone, no one's making any money. I'll just say that at the beginning, right? But there are plenty of people out there who are thinking of various ways in which they can try and earn a living right. engaged in philosophy as a way of life through book sales or organising courses or retreats or whatever it might be. And uh, not mentioning any names, I know someone who runs um, uh, um, philosophy cruises around the Mediterranean, right? So you go on the cruise, you have you have a series of lectures, and it's about I don't know ten thousand dollars for ten days. This is uh, uh, an occup this is a, uh, um, an occupation for the wealthy elite, and so it's philosophy as a way of life, but for a very restricted community. We're back to Plato and Aristotle as the wealthy aristocrats who have the leisure time to do this kind of thing, right? Um. But of course, that's not the only model of philosophy as a way of life that we see in ancient Greece. It's not just wealthy aristocrats. To come back to the last comment about subversion, we've also got people like Dodge the Cynic, right, who own nothing and live a very simple life. And again, in the modern Stoic movement, there are people that are very interested in environmentalism and who want to live a very simple life. And it's the kind of the hippie dropout end of the modern Stoic movement, which is very, very different. So to come back to your conclusion, we might think about ways in which philosophy might flourish outside the academy, but it could bifurcate or, or, or you know, um, into some very different models of what philosophy is where it look like. You can have your hippie dropouts into, you know, climate consciousness, and you can have your wealthy elite who are looking for a leisure activity. Um, and, and, and who knows what other versions might, might appear over time. Yes, yes, right. That's the right. Who knows? Who knows? But they, no, this is what happens in periods of cultural transition. 
lots of things, lots, lots of things in blue. Nobody would be looking for a way to do philosophy as a way of life for money if they had a tenure track job as an idea, right? So, so the fact that our institutions are imploding means that people are out. They are searching for something new because the uh, affordances of the old way of life are just not available. And so, so they're out there looking. And the first stage of change is always going to be lots of different folks. You know, everyone's got a different toolkit, so they're going to go use their toolkit out there. You know, I started a philosophy institute uh, in 1984, uh, the Love of Wisdom Institute. And uh, everyone who was in my institute wanted counseling. And because I got a therapist and a psychologist, it was very easy to do that. And uh, uh, just, you know, so like you, you play with what you got, right? And there'll be a lot of that. And then what will happen is some dominant superhero figures associated with some very important institutions. Remember, Harvard went through this change from liberal arts college to research university, and I am sure it'll go through another change if you still do something, right? So some institution will take a, a, a John Sellers, somebody and say, let's, let's go big with this, you know? Yeah. And then it'll start, although I'm not saying it's gonna look like uh, University Center, what it looks like right now, but like executive training or whatever. And then paradigms will, you know, will form, will take shape, but we don't know what they are yet. Thank you very much. Uh, once more, Leonard.